So our third snippet for this week is gonna look at um, the, the question of civil liberties as we kind of move beyond this national security emphasis um, uh, during the, the Eisenhower and early Kennedy administrations. And this is the era of, of what's sometimes called the Warren Court name for, for, for Earl Warren. Oops. Uh, the Chief Justice was appointed by Eisenhower, Republican. He had been the former Republican governor of California, but Warren winds up being a very, very liberal Supreme Court justice, and the the court as a whole shifts quite dramatically to the left during his 16 years where he's running things, especially the last um, uh, seven from 62 to 69, where he commands a pretty reliable five justice uh, liberal majority. Uh, but this is not a court where there are really any robustly conservative voices on the court. There are some moderates and, and, some, uh, and, and some liberals. And the, the Warren Court moves in a variety of ways. Um, the first is on the, on, uh, or among them are the freedom of religion. So this is a case that I know one of uh, one of the groups we've, we've looked at in, in the group, um, but the case is called Engel versus Vitale. It dealt with a mandatory uh, school prayer uh, case in New York where the regents um, had, had developed this kind of bizarre uh, prayer that all uh, public school kids in New York um, had to say. And the the prayer was seen as as kind of embodying a, a very loose form of Christianity. And so a group of parents, uh, mostly Jewish, but a couple of non-believing parents uh, uh, sue, arguing that it, that it violates the, the First Amendment. And the court in Engel um, says that that's in fact what the uh, what the regents had uh, had done, and the key holding of Engel, which is a very very unpopular decision, people see this as as improperly excluding uh, God from the uh, from the schools, is that it's neither sacrilegious nor anti-religious to say that each separate government in this country should stay out of the business of writing or sanctioning official prayers, and leave that purely religious function to the people themselves, and to those the people choose to look for uh, to look to for religious guidance. Engel, with regard to the what Justice Black called the wall of separation between church and state is a pretty easy decision. I mean, here the regents were writing a prayer. I mean, you can't get more official than that. A lot of the other, um, you know, uh, um, sort of church and state cases as they apply to, to public schools or other public entities are much harder cases than uh, than Engel. And this is an area that remains very unsettled in the uh, current law, although the, the Supreme Court in the last several years has been much more protective of, of religious rights than I think the, the Warren Court was. Um, another big area that the Warren Court deals with is um, uh, and this this is outside the this this step is going to look at Warren Court cases outside of the realm of race and and criminal justice issues, which are, are other steps are going to focus on those, um, but was the, the question of equ equality and representation. Um, and the, the starting point here um, was a case that came out of Tennessee. So these were the, uh, the, the, the House districts in Tennessee. They had nine districts. Um, and you can see that um, there were wide disparities in populations um, between these, uh, these districts. So a handful of Eastern Tennessee districts had more than 400 thousand people and then these districts which were in uh, fourth fourth through six which were in central Tennessee had between three and four hundred thousand people and then the western Tennessee districts two quite rural ones had only two hundred thousand people and then Memphis the district anchored in Memphis had six hundred thousand <laughs> pretty pretty big uh, jump here the backdrop to this was that Tennessee hadn't redistricted their their house districts for for decades um, and as Memphis became both a larger city and more African-American, the idea was, you know, basically to kind of limit black political power by not redrawing the district uh, lines. You'll notice too that these Eastern Tennessee districts tended to be more populous than the rest. Tennessee at this point is a state that's controlled by mostly conservative white Democrats, but Eastern Tennessee was a Republican area. So this was a, um, a boundary map that disfavored black voters and Republican voters and, and favored white Democrats democratic uh, voters. Um, and so a, a coalition of groups uh, sues, and the case is called Baker versus Carr, which um, which doesn't lay down standards in terms of how courts can consider this issue, but does say that there's a potential federal claim when there are wide disparities of populations between the district, like, like we see here. Um, this, however, triggers a, a ferocious dissent from Felix Frankfurter, a Roosevelt appointee. This is one of his last opinions on the Supreme Court, where um, Frankfurter argues that this approach, the Supreme Court involving itself in redistricting uh, matters, represents 
basically a political question, and it's not the job of the court to determine what is and is not a, um, uh, a political uh, uh, question uh, uh, debate. This is you know, uh, the, the, the principle of one person, one vote is now, I think, quite firmly established. But the, but the Frankfurter dissent here is it's sort of motivated um, or, or you saw the mindset of it in in the Supreme Court's uh, decision a couple of years ago that basically said we're going to we're going to stay out of the game in terms of restricting partisan uh, redistricting, and the effects of Baker become apparent in this um, very uh, uh, famous case um, uh, dealing uh, out of Atlanta. So um, th this was the the fifth district of Georgia, which was based in Atlanta in the Atlanta suburbs. It had way more uh, you know, Atlanta. This is a state which again is controlled at this point by segregationist whites. Atlanta has way more uh, people than any of the other house districts. This is a district that is disproportionately African-American. So civil rights groups uh, uh, challenge the uh, the suit, um, and in a case called Westbury versus Sanders, the the Supreme Court strikes down the Georgia map um, on grounds that the disparity in population between the Atlanta-based district and all the other House districts in Georgia violates a principle that the Supreme Court outlines in Westbury called one person, one um, uh, one vote. Um, and so this is a foundational voting rights decision or a voting equality uh, uh, decision um, by the court. And then the court expands this. Uh, and basically what Westbury says, as it's come to be interpreted by the court um, subsequently, is that, that US House districts essentially have to be the same size or very, very close to the same size within a state. So you can't have a state that has one house district with like 20,000 more people than another house uh, uh, district. There'll be very minor disparities, but that's it. The court is a little bit more liberal um, with regards to state legislative districts, but here again, um, in a case called uh, Reynolds versus Sims, uh, the court says that um, uh, uh, there needs to be more egalitarianism in district lines at the state legislative uh, um, uh, issue. Here they say because of tradition, because of geographical patterns within states, there could be more of a disparity between uh, uh, the population sizes of, of, of districts. If there's a 10% or so swing between state legislative districts, the courts have generally said that's okay, but you can get a sense of how incredibly large the uh, the gap was between uh, um, uh, the largest and smallest districts in some of the state uh, legislatures in the 1950s and 1960s, the most extreme are, are New Hampshire and Vermont, which had a state uh, a house, um, which dated back from the you know, early uh, republic, where each town or city would get one member of the um, uh, of the assembly. So you would have the the smallest town, which in New Hampshire was three people, um, would get a state legislature and a state legislator, and you know the largest district would be you know. Um, maybe half of a, a or a third of Manchester, the largest uh, city, would get would get, only get two or three um, uh, seats. So this this kind of recalled, if you remember the rotten boroughs that we looked at in the start of the semester. This is kind of what was going on in New Hampshire and Vermont during this time. But and this is a critical but. These two decisions, um, Westbury and Reynolds versus Sims, are seen as a, a, a dual blow. First, Southerners don't like them because they're worried about, uh, the, they see these, these opinions correctly as uh, increasing the political power potentially of African Americans in the South. But rural legislators don't like them either because their argument is that um, uh, it's important for districts to protect rural uh, uh, voters whose values, whose, whose interests may be just overwhelmed uh, if a legislature is dominated by, uh, by city interests. And so in 1964, there, there's a serious effort um, to with, by Congress to withdraw jurisdiction from the Supreme Court um, in reapportionment uh, cases. Um, uh, uh, via uh, uh, um, you know, a constitutional amendment, um, and the the proposal is is pushed by this man, um, uh, uh, Congressman William Tuck, who's a, a very conservative Democrat from uh, uh, from Virginia, um, and his proposal, uh, which is called the Tuck Bill, passes the House, um, and there's a real fear that it's going to pass the Senate because both the majority leader of the Senate, Mike Mansfield, a Democrat from Montana, and the minority leader of the Senate, Everett Dirksen, a Republican from Illinois, even though they're supportive of um, uh, of civil rights, are also uh, senators who who are sort of who 
who represent heavily rural areas. Um, Montana is a rural state. Dirksen's strength was in rural parts of Illinois and are sympathetic to the idea of the Tuck Bill. And so when the Tuck Bill is proposed to the Senate, there, there's a good chance that it's going to pass. Um, and liberals energize uh, in 1964. Uh, and what they attempt to do is to insert a platform plank. That's the, the sort of official statement of principles of the party. Um, a platform plank into the 1964 Democratic presidential platform officially opposing the Tuck Bill. So basically saying, if you're a good Democrat, you can't be supportive of this, uh, of this bill. This is uh, Lyndon Johnson's election campaign in 1964. Johnson wants, Johnson does not support the Tuck Bill. He sees it as a threat to civil rights, but he doesn't want a floor flight at, at his convention nominating him for president um, over this, you know, this piece of legislation. So instead, what he uh, he, he gets on the phone with his chief aide, a man named Bill um, Bill Moyers, um, and urges Moyers to to reach out to liberals um, and urge them to filibuster uh, the the Tuck Bill. Uh, this is kind of interesting thing if you've been following the news the last few weeks. You see all de all of these legislative Democrats arguing that the filibuster is racist and that it's sort of the the arc, you know, the um, the you know, it's a legacy of, of 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 slavery. You know, here's here's a case which is hardly the only one of uh, of liberal interest using uh, uh, the the influence of 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 the, of the filibuster. Um, Johnson will reference in his uh, 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 little in his phone call, which is a recorded phone call that Johnson secretly recorded lots of his uh, phone conversations. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger, who was a liberal historian from Harvard, later at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, had been a Kennedy aide, and Tony Lewis, who was the uh, New York Times chief uh, um, uh, Supreme Court correspondent. Um, and one other thing to keep in mind as you uh, as you listen to this conversation. Um, Johnson will disparagingly reference a, um, a senator, a Democratic senator from Illinois named Paul Douglas. Um, and Douglas's background, who's an economics professor, he's a professor at the University of Chicago before he was elected to the Senate. So the fact that he was an ex college professor, Johnson knows this and uh, Johnson sees this as a negative thing. So here's, uh, here's the clip. Why in the living hell they want to put it in the platform, notify every little state, Carl Albert's district is put together and he's abolished from Congress. Now who wants to do that to Carl Albert when he's the best instrument the liberals have for achievement in this town? That's Sam Rayburn. Now why would they want to abolish his district? And it's not so bad if the Senate abolishes or the court abolishes it. But it's awful if he is asked, the platform committee of which he heads to abolish himself. That's just cruel and human punishment. Now, it looks like even a goddamn college professor could understand that. Paul Douglas has got less sense than any man I know when judgment's required. He's always off chasing some damn balloon there. That's right. So, all right. Well, the, the, the pitch is this. They're coming, the, the, the Congress hasn't adjourned. It was due to adjourn. It didn't adjourn. Does Dr. Douglas know that? I hope he does. All right. Now, why didn't they adjourn? What are they coming back for? They're coming back to consider the Tuck Bill and the Dirksen Bill and the Mansfield Bill. Now, what they ought to do with the liberals want a real plan of attack, and Tony Lewis wants something to do, is get... Ten of them out here in Georgetown House some night with Arthur Fletcher. Let them all agree. One of them will talk four hours, and the other talk four hours. And that's what they do best. They talk. And Mansfield won't run after six o'clock. They'll do that for two weeks, and the show will be over. The Tuck Bill will be dead. The Supreme Court will be riding high, and that'll be it. Period. That's simple. You'll have to be smart to know that. Hell, I knew that before I left Johnson City. <laughs> Um, and th this is exactly what happens. The, the uh, Senate liberals filibuster the bill. The Tuck bill is is uh, is defeated in the Senate and or never comes to vote in the Senate. And then after 1964, it's a more liberal House and, and Senate and the Tuck bill sort of uh, sort of dies. But this is a it's a good reminder of how controversial some of the Warren court decisions uh, were and the, the sort of very intense political uh, backlash that they that they created on on voting and uh, representation issues, the liberals ultimately prevailed. But on race and and crime issues, it was a, sort of a different story. So our, our last snippet for this week is going to look at the the Warren Court and uh, and and race. <laughs> 